He is risen. He is risen. The early church would celebrate when they would come together and say, he is risen, he is risen indeed, because it is Jesus who is our hope and his resurrection. It is not just his death. It is his resurrection that gives us hope to new life. So he is risen. Yea, God. This morning as we get started, let's open our time with prayer. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have in Jesus to be able to know that new life is ours because of the resurrection. I thank you for the privilege that we have, those of us who know Jesus as our Savior, to know that the struggles and the turmoil and the, the stuff of this side of forever is only temporary. And one day we will see Jesus and all of our ailments, all of our sicknesses, all of our worry, all of our fears, everything will be gone. And yet, Lord, we don't only look forward to that as something that might happen on the other side of the grave, but we can actually walk in the fullness and the power of the resurrection of Christ today. The Apostle Paul said to us, the, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living inside of us. So we give you thanks for that today. May we never forget the resurrection. We, may we never forget the hope of the soon returning Jesus. So we look to you today as our Savior. We look to you today as our uh, healer. We look to you today as the one who sanctifies us. We look to you today as the one who is our coming King. And we say, hallelujah, what a Savior. We celebrate your raising from the dead, Lord Jesus. And we will do that in song. We will do that in testimony. All to your glory. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. I will invite you to stand with us as we sing Low in the Grave.
Yun. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Earth and heaven in chorus say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye hands and earth reply. Again, our glorious King, Alleluia. Where all death is now, thy sting, Alleluia. Once he died, our souls to save, Alleluia. Where's thy victory, boasting grace? Redeeming work is done Alleluia For the fight, the battle won Alleluia Death in vain forbids him rise Alleluia Christ has opened paradise Before you sit down, take a moment to greet someone around you. I've invited Leanne to read scripture this morning. Come on up, Leanne. I'm reading Luke 24, 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. 
But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to, to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Let's pray. And they ran to the tomb wondering what had happened. We don't wonder anymore. Thank you. Lord, we know that today is just a day on the calendar, but it reminds us of the very real truth that not only did you die for our sins, but you raised up for us to have new life. We thank you that even back on Good Friday, it was your stripes that you bore all the penalty of our sins, but your resurrection gives us new life. And we celebrate that today. Lord, we celebrate the privilege that we have had to be able to bring our cares and our concerns, our burdens to you over this past year. And we have seen you answer time and time and time and time again. You have been so good to us, Lord Jesus. And even in the midst of the struggle that some of us are facing, even today, in our family lives, in our personal situations, in the lives of relations with friends and distances, Lord, I thank you that in Jesus we have hope of new life. Thank you that we can come to you unashamed. In fact, your word says to us that we can boldly come to you like a child would come to his father and ask for help. We can come to you and know that in no way you would cast us out. And so we thank you for that privilege, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of being able to worship together, not just as one congregation meeting here at this hour, but before us, Lord, our Chinese congregation who was able to worship you, um, on Wednesdays, our Persian fellowship, who are able to worship you together with one voice, that same voice. And on Thursday nights, our new flame ministry that again gets to worship you together. And Lord, before COVID, none of us would have imagined the struggles that we'd been through. And in the middle of COVID, we wondered if we would ever get out. But just like you are true to your word, Lord, you brought new life and you continue to do that. So we worship you. We celebrate Jesus today. Lord, thank you for the privilege of looking to you. Thank you that you took what we could not so that we could live with you today and in glory. And we give you thanks as we continue to offer our worship to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand once again and sing in Christ alone. In Christ alone.
He is risen. Oh, welcome to the most wonderful day of celebration of the year. Some people think that it's Christmas and the joy of the gift of the Savior. But the gift of the Savior, he came for this. He came for this. And what a glorious day we have. Today we get to celebrate together the power of the resurrected Jesus. Almost 2,000 years have passed. And God's redemptive plan for mankind, it changed the world forever. The power of sin and death has broken through. And the crucifixion of Jesus was real. It was an actual event. But the resurrection of Jesus was also real. It actually took place. He did not die and lay in the ground and stay there. He was raised to new life. What a joy that would have been to be at that first Easter. Death defeated. Life, God's life revealed for the first time. And those who were witnesses got to see it. Well, today's the culmination of the series that I've done for Easter called Come Alive. And today's the culmination of the Holy Week celebration. It all comes together in this. We started last Sunday to come alive to the life that was far beyond anything we could imagine and far beyond our human understanding and abilities to understand. And on Good Friday, we didn't look down in shame, but we looked up at the cross that was given to us, the cross that we could look at and celebrate the beautiful cross for us that Jesus went to and took our place so that we could look up and come alive to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And today we get to celebrate. Today is all new. Jesus is alive. And through the resurrection, we come alive again to the power of God to change our lives. Not to leave us the way we were when we came in, not to leave us the way we were dead in our sins, but to come alive and literally change us from death to life, from death to a new creation. Now, you may think that you don't have the power to change yourself. Your attitude, your outlook on life may stink. And when people come around you, they're more down than they are up. I have good news for you because of Jesus. You have the actual ability to affect those around you. You may feel like you don't have the strength to continue on in the life that you're living right now. You may think there's struggles at work that are unbelievable and you can't overcome. You may feel like your marriage is hopeless and there is nothing that can do to break through. You may think that the addiction that you have right now is too strong. And that nobody could forgive you for your past. You may think that you don't have the power to love your enemy. The strength to live. And yet the life of Christ is calling us to come alive. You may feel like you don't have the power to change your life. But here's the good news. You're not alone. And Christ died and lives for you. The good news that we have to celebrate today is that you don't have the power to change your life. Well, that didn't sound like good news. No, you don't. But Jesus does. And he offers himself to you today to become a new creation, to come alive in Jesus. And that's why we have Jesus. And that's the good news of Easter. You may be wondering, what in the world is good news right now in 2023? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For God made Jesus, who knew no sin, be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And this is what that verse means. It literally means that God made Jesus sin. 
Not that he would commit sin. He made him the embodiment of sin. Well, what do you mean by that? It makes no sense. It makes sense in this, that God the Father treated Jesus, the pure and holy, spotless Lamb of God. He made him as though he had committed every sin that every person had ever committed. And it was placed on him. In, when in fact, he had never committed a sin at all. Jesus wasn't hanging on the cross because of his sin. No, Jesus never sinned. Hanging on the cross, he was pure, spotless, blameless lamb. He was never for a single second a sinner. He was holy God on the cross. However, God the Father treated him as though he had lived my life. As though he had committed every sin that every person on every street had ever committed. God punished Jesus for our sin. And then he turns right around as though we had lived Jesus' life. And that's the great teaching of the Bible. It's the great teaching that we know as substitutionary atonement. I know, theological word. But it means that he paid the price for our sin as our substitute on the cross. That's the heartbeat of the good news. It's the heartbeat of God. In Jesus, we have complete forgiveness. Not just forgiveness for the nice things or the easy things or the little oopsies but for the deep, dark sin that we hide, that nobody else knows about. But before him, we're stripped naked. He sees us. And yet when he sees us, he sees Jesus, not us. And when God looks at the cross, he sees you and me. But then when he sees us on the cross, he sees his son, Jesus. And he didn't stay there dead on the cross. He was buried and then on the third day, defeating death, not just wounding death, but defeating death and the power of sin, the power of shame, the death that was held over us. He gave us the ability like him to come alive, to be raised from death to life. And as a result of Jesus' resurrection, every person that receives him, every person that receives the gift of grace by believing in him, now has the power of God living inside of him. It's the resurrection power of God that can change the worst of sinners into the most beautiful saint. Our life of death and defeat to bring us joy, hope, and everlasting life. That's what Easter is about. In the New Testament, a man who actually put Christians to death experienced a radical life change. He knew that life depended on Jesus and the power of the resurrection of Jesus. Listen to what this man says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. That was the goal of the Apostle Paul's life. It was to know Jesus and to know the power of the resurrection in every part of his everyday life. Paul's ability to get through each day. Paul's ability to get through shipwrecks. Paul's ability to be able to manage through being bit by snakes, to be stoned. Paul's ability to go through all of that was because of his hope that he had in Jesus, the living power of God living in him. And Paul wanted this same thing so badly for you and me too. Listen to how he prayed for his friends in the church of Ephesus, because he's praying this for you as well. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 says, I also pray that you may understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead 
and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in heaven. Think about it. This same power that raised Jesus from the dead and gave him the ability and the authority to rule over the entire universe, it's available to you and me. Okay, let me try that again. The same ability that could raise a dead man back to life is available to you and me. Oh, okay, all right. So now we're getting somewhere. Because if you can't understand the fact that God has given this life and hope to you, listen, I get it, Andrew, you're getting way too excited. But how can I not get excited today? If for just one day of the year you permit me my little bit of craziness, this same God actually offers to us the hope of resurrection. No matter what has gone on in your past that you still can't forgive. No matter what, he has given you victory in Jesus. No matter how rotten life is, no matter how difficult your job is, no matter how disturbing your children are, or maybe how disturbing your parents are, he has given you life and power, not just to cope, but to live. No matter what type of pain that you've gone through. George knows we received an email this morning from someone who's just heartbroken over a tragedy that has happened in his life. And he is without Christ. And the reason he's without hope, without, without joy, without being able to live today is because he keeps denying and mocking the one who's offered him life. Oh, what joy is offered to you and me today. The empty grave, the empty cross shouts to you and me today. There is hope. There is hope in Jesus. The word that Paul used for power when he said the power of Christ, it's the word that we use, we get the word dynamite from. It's the, the word dynamos. Now, I don't know about you, but I think it would be really cool to have a stick of dynamite and throw it into something and watch it blow up. I know you might think that I'm a little bit weird that way, but that may be the little guy thing that's in me. I think it would be fun, that explosive power. But to have power like resurrection living inside of me and me not to use it, it's just silly. The Apostle Paul said, I want to know it. I want to own it. I want that power to transform me from the thing that I think that I am into the thing that he calls me, his child. It's my goal, yes. It's my goal to know Jesus and to know the power of his resurrection. And that's what he prayed for us to know as well. The good news of Easter is that Jesus not only died for our sins, he offers us cleansing. And that same power that raised him from the dead 2,000 years ago can help us live today in our struggle. So what is resurrection power? It's the power to cancel. Cancel our past, to cancel our present, to cancel even our future sins. So many people walk through life carrying around a weight of burden of past failures, past mistakes, past sins, things that just weigh them down. They become overwhelmed by regret of the things that they've done or the way that they feel. I've been there. And when I say cancel your past, I'm not talking about denying it. I'm not saying that, that it never existed. Cancel means to eliminate. It means to remove. It means to literally delete that which has happened. 
Have you ever gotten halfway through a project and thought, man, I wish I could do a, a, a do-over, a, a start again? About every one of my do-it-yourself projects at home are like that. It's true, isn't it, Rhonda? <laughs> a lot of them are like that. I, I'm, I'm not a great carpenter. I do it when I have to, and but I sure wish I had a do-over. And I, when I have a do-over, I wish I had a do-over with someone who actually knew what they were doing in carpentry or in anything else that I've set my hand to. But here is the really good news for us. The biggest mistakes that I've made in my life have not happened because I built a shelf the wrong way and it's on a little bit of a, a, an angle. Or because I thought that the easiest way to fix a plumbing pipe was actually to use that tape that you see on late night television and wrapped it around there and made it work, only to find a puddle underneath the sink afterwards. No, those aren't my biggest mistakes. My biggest mistakes is that I chose to disobey God. And you chose to disobey God. It's called sin. And there isn't a single person here that is not affected by that. And the glorious hope that we have is that in believing in Jesus, we have a do-over. And God looks at us as though it was Jesus. But perhaps you've made so many mistakes and so many failures. You've had so many problems and you've made so many bad decisions that even the biggest do-over button wouldn't work. Some people can't seem to let go of the past. And as a result, their past dictates everything that they do in the future and every way that they feel. Some live in this constant state of regret, remorse over the things that they've done or become or said. They continually second guess themselves because they're tortured by painful memories. But I have great news. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to walk around with a, an unbearable load of guilt and of sin and hurt and painful memories. Listen to what's happened as a result of death and as a result of the resurrection of Jesus. Paul says to the believers in Colossae, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, you were past completed tense. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature. And it was not yet cut away from you. But God, two of the most powerful words in all of scripture, but God. God, I was caught in my sin. I did blow it there. I was a mess. I did wreck things up. But God made you alive in Christ, for he forgave your sins. He canceled the record of all of your charges against you. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. Let me say that again. Christ has done away with the record of the charges against you by nailing them to the cross. How many sins did he forgive? All of them. Yeah, but not mine. You see, you don't understand what I... Yes, he did. Now, that doesn't mean that on this side of forever there aren't consequences to the things that we've done. It doesn't mean that, that when we've hurt someone physically that, that they still bear the scars of that. That's not what it means. It means forever the associated guilt of that is now gone from us and we are made alive to Christ. When a person goes to jail and they've committed a heinous crime and yet they find Christ somehow in jail, does that mean automatically the jailer says, okay, you're free, go. No, there are consequences for our sin on this side of forever. But the guilt and the shame are gone. And one day we will fully realize the freedom that we have 
when we see Jesus face to face. So what is sin? Daniel, be proud of me this morning. I picked up my bow and arrow. No, I didn't grab an arrow. But I picked up my bow and I, I'm longing for this day. Some of you know that I like archery and Dan is my mentor teacher on this. And I'm going to try sometime over the next year or two to actually get good enough that I could hunt. But I grabbed my bow this morning and I wanted so badly to be able to pull back the, the pounds. What is it, 35 pounds or 40 pounds, something like that? <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and I put the wrist strap on my wrist and I hooked it up. And for those of you who don't know, I broke my arm this year. And uh, it's not in great shape. And it's probably not the smartest thing to do to try to pull back that kind of weight on my wrist, especially considering it was a compression break in my wrist. But I put it on Rhonda's looking at me, she just shakes her head. And I grabbed the thing and I held it out with this arm and I locked the thing in on this arm. And I pulled back. And I got it without too much pain and I'm holding it and I think what happens when I let go it's gonna hurt because it pulls back like this but I thought okay I'll try and I gently came in and it went in and I'm okay and it didn't hurt that bad but you see our sin is like an archery term it's like trying our best and aiming at the target and pulling the arrow back and letting it fly, hoping to hit the bullseye, but we are just off a little bit. Actually, that's not what it means at all. It means we pull the arrow back and we go, Woohoo! Yeah, let's go. Hey, way over there, too. Because our mark is only one thing it's Jesus and it's his holiness. And yet, how many times in our life, with even our best efforts, we're way off the mark. We don't hit it. It's because we are sinners. But one day, sin will be gone too. And we'll never miss a mark again. There are so many things that drive us away from the target, which is holiness. God wants us to be holy and wants us to be pure. And yet our desires and our, our plans and our mistakes, we, we find ourselves going in, in 90 or 180 degrees from where it is that we intended to go. And we end up miserable and empty. And again, so the good news is that God offers us complete forgiveness. He says that he cancels every record of the charges against us, and he forgives them all. Listen, in school, if you got 80%, it was pretty good, right? And if you got 90%, it was really good. But if you had to get 100% to live or die, and your best effort's 98 You've missed the mark. But in Christ, he blots out, he wipes away, he washes us completely. That means our sins are not just forgiven, but he makes this deliberate choice to remember them no longer. Well, does that mean that the God that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, when we said that he was always knowing and always seeing, does that mean somehow he's Got amnesia? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means, in fact, that he can remember every time I sinned and caused a nail to go in his hand. And he also remembers being on the cross saying, I forgave you. I forgave you. I forgave you. He takes our sin and he casts it as far as the east is from the west, not because he can't remember. I mean, for goodness sakes, I walk into a room sometimes and think, what on earth did I come in here to do? And I go back into the other room and I say, Rhonda, do you remember why I got up to go into the other room? 
Yeah, I think you went in there to get your blood pressure medication. No, no, I didn't go in to get my blood pressure medication. I'm just, oh yeah, maybe I should have gone in there to get my blood pressure medication. And then I remember, oh yeah, I went, I got up because I had to go to the bathroom. Jesus doesn't only know the sins that I have committed, but he also remembers the price it cost him to forgive me for my sins. He knows what it cost him, and he still forgave me. He doesn't rub them in, he rubs them out. He didn't come to condemn us. He came to change us. You know the verse, John 3, 17, for God did not send his son Jesus into this world to point an accusing finger, reminding you of how bad you were. He came to help. He came to set things straight again. Have you ever played with an Etch-a-Sketch? I used to love the Etch-a-Sketch when I was young. You know, you'd draw something with those knobs and that little red board and the gray screen and this black picture would come up. And of course it was a masterpiece, but every time you messed it up, all you had to do was put it up over your head and give it a good shake, screen clean. In Jesus, we have the best clean slate that we could ever imagine. The Bible says that God has that kind of power in our life because of Jesus' death and his sacrifice, but because of his resurrection, he takes away our regrets. He wipes them clean. And that happens the moment we believe in Jesus, but it may take a lifetime to realize how great he is. Now, it's not a license to go back and sin again. It's freedom knowing that we don't have to drink from that old, dirty, polluted well again. But it gets even better than that. How can it get better than that? Jeremiah 31, 34 says, God speaking, he says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will never remember them again. Deliberate choice from God. From those of you who are here today, and have received Jesus at some point in time in your life. But you're struggling. I get it. Life's tough. You wish you weren't made the way you were. You wish you didn't carry so much of the burden on your back. And that as much as God makes a choice to forget your sin, you can't forget yours. And the struggle of sin and defeat is so heavy on you that you can't walk in freedom. Well, you know you're saved, but every day is a struggle. The good news is, is when we come back to Jesus, we come back and, and and genuinely do business with him. It's not, okay, Jesus, all the sins that I've committed today, would you just forgive me for them? No, it means saying them. Confession means you speak it to him. You tell him what you've done. You tell him where you've been. You tell him the things that you've fallen down on. You explain clearly to him what has happened. And the Bible says when you come to him and confess your sins and ask him to forgive you, that he receives you, that he wipes your slate clean, cancels your debt, and in no way keeps you back. How can God do that? What basis is that forgiveness? Romans 8.1 says, therefore, there is no condemnation. For those of us who are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, one of the last things he said was, it is finished. 
not it's almost done, not I'm still trying, not give me a few more hours on the cross to pay for Andrew's sin. He said it's finished, canceled, paid in full. That's what Jesus did on the cross for you. That's why there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It's because it's been canceled. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to give us a new identity. Dead in our trespasses and sin or alive to freedom in Christ. It's better than a witness protection plan. See, in our culture, we define ourselves by our race. We define ourselves by our religion, our political party, social status, even our gender. We find our identity in our occupation, in our hobbies, where we went to school, in our looks or our spanky little clothes that should have been on for Palm Sunday. We define ourselves in who we're dating or who we used to date, who we're married to or who we used to be married to. And sometimes people have hidden their identity or their addiction, their weight issue, their health issue, a, a, a label like adoption or a divorced or poor or maybe unwanted or unloved. But again, good news. The resurrection power of Jesus changes all of that. Because Jesus conquered sin and conquered death, we don't have to be defined any longer by the terms that the world might define us as or that we've even defined ourselves as. Our identity is now shaped in the one called Jesus. And when we come to God our, and put our faith in Jesus alone and receive his free gift of salvation, God now calls us a friend. Blessed. Loved. Favored. Disciple. John 1.12 says, But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to be called. He gave them the right to be called, which means that I am a child. I'm a child of God. I don't know about you, but I've disappointed my dad sometimes. I've disappointed my mom sometimes. I'm probably the only one. So you can point at me. I'm the bad guy. I've done things that certainly didn't honor the Hamilton name very well. I've done some things that my mom wanted to not only pull her own hair out, but mine. She probably has some of it still caught in her own fingers. I've done some things that, that really my brothers or my sister might have said, oh, you're not part of this family, Andrew. Not for what you've done. But I'm a child of God. And in him, I'm made new. And whatever you've called your identity I just pray that somehow God, the God of the universe, could speak through me to you today to say you're not defined by that anymore. You're my child. I've adopted you by my grace. Call me dad. You're my child. I'm forever your father. I will never disgrace you. I will never think ill of you. I've given my son Jesus for you so that you are mine. Second Corinthians 1.22 says, And God has identified us and set his seal of ownership on us 
by putting the Holy Spirit in, his, in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing the work he has completed. You can let go of the image that you think you are or that you think you know you are. You can accept, stop accepting what other people have called you, what other people have labeled you at. And you can start believing what God says about you in Jesus. You are a child of God. That's how he defines everyone who has believed in his name. The thing is, you don't have to know who you are even today. Because some of us are confused. But you are who God says you are. And no one else has the right to say anything more about it. Because of the power of the resurrection, you are now identified with Jesus. And you have the power of the Holy Spirit living within you. He has given you and me a new identity. And here's one of the most powerful truths. One of the most powerful truths that you will ever hear about Jesus. We are not only saved by his death, we are also saved by his life. That means that a risen Jesus lives inside of us and his power lives inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. His divinity inhabits our broken humanity. That means that we can face tomorrow. We really can face tomorrow. Even when tomorrow looks like... I won't even use it. We can face it because of him. Regardless of what happens to you, regardless of the struggles that you go through, regardless of what might have happened in your family, you have the power to stand and face it, not because of you, but because of his strength. Again, Paul said, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives in me. Think of the prospect of having a risen Jesus living in and through your life. The possibilities are endless. Life full of ups and downs, stress, heartaches, disappointments, setbacks, trials, defeats, tragedies. How in the world can we face the twists and turns, the roadblocks of this crazy world that we live in today? The roadblocks that we're facing every day that can alter our lives and destroy our ends. It's the power of the risen Jesus Christ in our lives, sustaining us by his Holy Spirit and carrying us through his power and grace. Yay, God! Romans 8, verse 11 says this, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you life to your physical body so that the same Spirit is living within you. That is great news. And Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not death, not life, not angels, not demons, neither fears about today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yea, God! This is Resurrection Sunday. The dead is gone. Let it go and come alive to Christ. But I, no, not but I, but he. Yeah, but you don't know. I don't need to know. He knows and he's forgiven it. And in him we're alive. We serve a resurrected Savior, not a dead Savior. We don't serve someone who's still on the cross. We serve someone who was put in the grave and is raised from the grave. Who gives us the power and the strength to face even what you're going through today. So I have some good news for you. 
Back in 2008, I had the privilege of going to Israel. And on our second last day there, we took a tour to just the outside of Jerusalem. We saw this rock hill that stood there that was crazy. It looked like a skull. And we walked up to that and we saw this hole cut in a rock. And beside that hole cut in the rock was a giant stone. And we walked inside that place called a tomb. And we were told that's the place they laid Jesus. I've got great news for you. He isn't there. He isn't there. I've seen it with my own eyes. And you can say, oh yeah, well, Andrew, you know, all this time's passed. Someone's stolen his body. No, I know it by faith. He is raised to life. Because he lives. Because he lives. We live. And yes, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives. And maybe you're not one of those who are already saved and in the family today. He also offers to you the power for a new start. And the power to live. But you can't do it alone. You can't do it on your own strength. You don't have the power to forgive or cleanse yourself. There isn't enough self-help books in the world. The only one that you have is Jesus. And in the midst of all of your struggles, remember this. For this, I have Jesus. Don't believe the lie that tells you that you can't handle anything. And don't believe the lie that says God wouldn't give me anything that I cannot handle. That is a lie from hell. It's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is that's applying to sin. He will not give you temptation beyond what you can handle. What the Bible says is that life is more than we can handle. But we've been given Jesus. And because we've been given Jesus, we can live. You see, because if we could handle the things of life, we would have no need for Jesus. We'd have no need for Easter. We'd have no need for God himself. The resurrection means that no situation is too hopeless, no night is too dark. That he is still in the resurrection business. And he has the power to change your life. But my question is this, do you believe that today? Do you believe it today? By the way, this means yes. Do you believe that he has the power to make you new? Then let's sing. Let's sing of the power of God to change our lives, to raise us to new life. Stand with me. Turns from the empty tomb. Hears a voice speaking, calling her name. It's the Master, the Lord, raised to life again. The voice that spans the years, speaking life, stirring all, bringing peace to us. Will sound till he. Risen for the dead. One with the Father, angels.
ancient of days through the spirit you blows faith with certainty So here's the scoop. Okay, let's just go right down to brass tacks. My bet is that most of us here have made a profession of faith in Jesus at some point in time in our lives. And that's awesome. Like, seriously, it's awesome. But here's another reality. A lot of us are walking around as though we're half dead. Cool. Okay, forget it. I won't point any fingers. I walk around sometimes like I'm half dead. And sometimes I don't live in the freedom that I could because the burdens of today are just too big for this big guy to handle. But I stand on the authority of God's word, and it is this, that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of me. And he lives inside of you too. So if you're struggling with stuff, my encouragement to you today is let it go. Come back to life that he's offered you. If you're struggling because you've got this identity problem where you still remember yourself as that person or with that label, I really wish that somehow we could all be colorblind today and yet at the same time have our eyes open to the beautiful color and difference of each one of us. I really wish that somehow we could let a lot of the stuff of what separates us go away to only recognize this, that we've been made one in Christ. If only we could let go of those other things, we would find out Jesus' prayer for us come to reality in Johnson 17, that we would be one. The new commandment that he gave us, love one another, love one another, just like I've loved you. Sometimes you sit on this side or you sit on this side because I don't get along with that person over there or that person over there. It's got to go away if we want to be able to be effective for Christ, for his kingdom right here on Main Street. He's offered us life together as a family of God. So I'm calling us to new life. There's things that are calling you to put a division between you and someone else here today. There's never been a better time than Easter Sunday for you to let that go and that new life come between you. 
If there's something that separates you and causes you anxiety with someone else that's in here, there's never been a better day for you to let that go so that you can recognize that Christ has made us one together. Do you agree that that's a good thing? I do. And that's my prayer for us today. Lord Jesus, would you make us one? Would you make us one for the sake of your kingdom? Because there are people right here on Main Street and there are people right in our own families that need to see Jesus. But if we can't find a way to love each other, there isn't any way that we're going to see new life in them. We believe that Jesus is coming back soon, so God cause us to love each other. So that we might be your kingdom right here on Main Street. Put new life inside of us again. And may we only see Jesus. And it's in, in his name that we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. He is risen. He's risen indeed.